Um, I had the honor of being the founder of this. That's why I get the honor of, of introducing the speaker. I must compliment Doug, though. I mean, I mean, the American Action Forum has consistently fought above its weight. It's it's just been a great uh, organization. I've taken great pride in and 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 you know, John, we formed this right after the uh, uh, 08 election in order to kind of bring people together around a common common themes that we can all support. And I also compliment Doug as, as, as a master of timing because the first of these lecture series was held the day Scott Walker emerged as a favorite in Iowa and, and splurged onto the national scene high in the polls. And th that very day was the day he, he, he inaugurated this series. And now here we are at a period of time when the world indeed is a mess, uh, when there's a fight going on in, in the Senate over the Patriot Act, which, which our guest speaker is, uh, of, of course, one of the leaders of, of uh, I, I think, doing the right thing. Uh, you all know John McCain. He's the most famous senator in the United States, perhaps the most famous member of the United States Congress. So I don't, I don't have to go into his background. I would just say this. What an honor it is to have somebody here with us at the American Action Forum who's a true American hero. There's not many people who are true American heroes. There are not too many people who have done had the courage to choose the harder right versus the easier wrong so many occasions and with such vitality, vigor, and steadfastness as John McCain. And now, from American hero, he's become perhaps the most influential senator in the United States of America, John McCain. Well, thank you, Fred, and thank you for those kind words, and despite your West Point education, Fred is one of America's most successful businessmen. He's answered his nation's call to, res to service on numerous occasions, and I'm very proud to call Fred a friend. Um, also very fortunate over the years to have benefited from the wise counsel of your president, Doug Holtzaken. Uh, for many years, he remains a trusted friend and advisor. I relied on him during my presidential campaign, and so, therefore, maybe you could argue that he's the reason why I lost. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the American Action Forum, and I commend you for the work you've done to promote free enterprise and smarter government. I'm pleased to see you've expanded your advocacy on defense issues, and it couldn't come at a more important time. The past few months, the Senate Armed Services Committee has received testimony from many of America's most respected statesmen, thinkers, and former military commanders. These leaders had a common warning. And by the way, these leaders range from Henry Kissinger and Madeleine Albright and Brent Scowcroft and uh, is a big Brzezinski. We have tried to form the Center Armed Service Committee in a way that, at least to some degree, policy drives the budget as opposed to budget driving policy. Uh, but these leaders had a common warning. Uh, America is facing the most diverse and complex array, array of crises since the Second World War. For the past decade, our adversaries have been rapidly improving their militaries to counter our unique advantages. And at the same time, our Defense Department has grown larger, but less capable, more complex, but less innovative, more proficient at defeating low-tech adversaries, but more vulnerable to high-tech ones. The self-inflicted wounds of sequestration have made all of this worse. As a result, America has reached a key inflection point. The liberal world order, which has been anchored by U.S. hard power for seven decades, is being seriously stressed, and with it, the foundation of our security and prosperity. It doesn't have to be this way. We can choose a better future for ourselves, but only if we make the right decisions now to set us on a better course. This president may not be willing to adopt different policies, but we can lay the groundwork for his successors to lead more decisively and to do so buttressed by greater defense capabilities. That's why I'm striving as chairman of the Center Armed Services Committee to contribute in some small but meaningful way to the effectiveness of the U.S. military, the restoration of America's global leadership, and the defense of a liberal world order. 
I believe the committee took a strong first step in this direction with the National Defense Authorization Act. We passed out a committee last month in an overwhelming bipartisan support, 22 to 4. For 53 years, the Congress has passed an NDAA. This year should be no different. I'm gratified by Leader McConnell's commitment to resuming regular order and bringing the NDAA to the floor this week so that the conference can begin later this summer. The NDAA coming before the Senate this week is a reform bill. It's a reform bill. It tackles acquisition reform, military retirement reform, personnel reform, headquarters and management reform. This legislation delivers sweeping defense reforms that will enable our military to rise to the challenges of a more dangerous world, both today and in the future. We, identi we identified $10 billion of excess and unnecessary spending from the President's budget request, and we are reinvesting <coughs> it in military capabilities for our warfighters and reforms that can yield long-term savings for the Department of Defense. And we did all of this while upholding our commitments to our service members, retirees, and their families. On acquisition reform, we put the services back into the acquisition process, created new mechanisms to ensure accountability for results, streamlined regulation, and opened up the defense acquisition process to our nation's innovators. On military reform, we have taken important steps to modernize and improve our military retirement system. Today, 83% of service members leave the service with no retirement assets. Under the new plan, 75% of service members would get benefits. This reform is estimated to save $15 billion per year in the out years. On management reform, we ensure that the Department of Defense and the military services are using precious defense dollars to fulfill their missions and defend the nation, not expand their bloated staffs. Our bill mandates a 30% cut in funding for headquarters and administrative staff over the next four years. These reductions generate $1.7 billion in savings for FY16 alone. With these savings and billions more identified throughout the bill, we, investigated in cru we invested in crucial military capabilities for our warfighters. We accelerate shipbuilding for Virginia-class submarines, destroyers, and amphibious assault ships and other Navy programs. We address strike fighter capacity shortfalls by fully restoring the A-10, adding F-35s and F-18s, and upgrading our F-15s. <clears throat> we invest in modernization across the services and meet our commander's most urgent priorities. As adversaries threaten our military technological advantage, our bill looks to the future and invests in new breakthrough technologies, including directed energy and unmanned combat aircraft. And we support our allies and partners with robust training and assistant initiatives. We authorize providing Ukraine the defensive lethal assistant, it's the assistance it needs to build combat capability to defend its sovereign territory. And we create a new initiative to provide, provide equipment, supplies, and training to Southeast Asian nations to build maritime domain awareness capabilities to address growing maritime sovereignty challenges in the South China Sea. Reforms in this bill are sweeping, but we still have a lot of work to do. I've made clear from the beginning of my chairmanship that my top priority is to repeal sequestration once and for all. Sequestration has already done lasting damage to the capabilities, readiness, morale, and modernization of America's armed forces. And every one of our military service chiefs testified before our committee that if we fund defense at sequestration levels in the coming fiscal year, we will place American lives at risk. That's why the NDAA supports the President's budget request of $612 billion for national defense and some $38 billion above the BCA caps. And following the budget resolution passed by the Senate, the NDAA funds in, that increase through Overseas Contingency Operations, or OCO funds. 
Recently, the president and some Democrats have threatened to oppose the NDAA and other defense bills if they do not get increases in non-defense spending in exchange. As a recent White House policy statement said, quote, the president has been very clear he will not fix defense without fixing non-defense spending. Such intransigence reveals a troubling misalignment of priorities on the part of the White House. It is the first duty of the federal government to protect the nation. The NDAA is a policy bill. It doesn't spend a dollar. It provides the Department of Defense and our men and women in uniform with the authorities and support they need to defend the nation. It's not the place for fights over government spending. To be clear, using OCO to pay for our national defense for just the next fiscal year is not my preference, and it remains, <laughs> but in the absence, uh, and it remains my highest priority as to solve sequestration in the Budget Control Act once and for all, but in the absence of such an argument, agreement, I refuse to ask the brave young Americans in our military to defend this nation with insufficient resources that would place their lives in unnecessary danger. Holding the NDAA hostage to force that solution would be a deliberate and cynical failure to meet our constitutional duty to provide for the common defense. My friends, the NDAA that the Senate Armed Services Committee has passed is an ambitious piece of legislation, but let me be the first to say that it is only a first step. We need a strategy to renew American leadership. We need to repeal sequestration while rooting out and eliminating waste, and we need to continue to champion the cause of reform and defense acquisition. Pentagon management and military personnel policy there's much work, much work left to be done. Success is the only outcome that will ensure that the Department of Defense is prepared to meet our present and future national security challenges. This success is possible, and I've never been more excited or grateful for the opportunity to serve than I am right now. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the Senator has agreed to take questions. If you uh, have a question, please raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. Uh, please identify yourself and ask your question in the form of a question, with the question mark at the end. Sir. Uh, Colin Clark, Breaking Defense. Uh, Senator McCain, uh, the senior folks in AT&L, uh, Pentagon Acquisition, Mr. Kendall and company, uh, are apparently very uncomfortable with your uh, transfer of authority to the service chiefs. Um, what do you say to them? Well, I say to them, I'd be glad to provide a long list of programs and the cost overruns associated with those programs. The absolutely outrageous overruns and even failures completely of various programs for the last 10 years. The future combat system, we've never seen a single result. The USS Gerald R. Ford, a $2.4 billion cost overrun, and that overrun is not finished yet. Uh, it's hard for me to go back to Arizona and argue strenuously for more defense spending when we waste $2.4 billion dollars on one weapon system, as important and vital as the carrier may be. So anybody who believes, as they seem to in at &L, that the status quo is satisfactory, uh, then they're, they're not reflecting the concerns of the taxpayers of America. Just finally, one small item. It was a year ago I asked the Secretary, uh, the Chief of Naval Operations at a hearing who was responsible for the $2.4 billion cost overrun associated with the Gerald R. Ford. The Chief of Naval Operations said, I don't know. There's got to be some responsibility assumed by the leaders of our armed services, and we are trying to put them back into that process. We're not eliminating at &L. But what, we're pro what I believe you're seeing right now is the classic turf, turf fight in the Pentagon. Um, 
I'm Xiao Yan from the Voice of America China branch. A few days ago, you said U.S.-China should not have a conflict, but U.S. should take uh, actions to curb what China is doing in South China Sea. Can you e elaborate on that? And also, in China, you were labeled uh, as an anti-China force in U.S. Congress. Uh, what's your comment on that? Well, I'm always honored uh, mm -hmm. to be labeled. Uh, I was sanctioned by Vladimir Putin. Uh, I was recently, Lindsey Graham and I were featured in the ISIS magazine as, a, <laughs> as, a, as a two uh, cru crusaders. Uh, as I mentioned, Vladimir Putin uh, sanctioned me. Uh, unfortunately, we were unable to go to Siberia again this spring. Uh, so. All I can say is, uh, well, um, I'm honored by their criticism. On the issue of what we can do, one of the provisions in the defense authorization, authorization bill is $425 million over four years to help the nations in the region with maritime capabilities, with better coordination, with communications, with help in policy development. And last year, uh, in the last year's bill, we relaxed the restrictions on Vietnam and allowed them to purchase U.S. maritime capabilities. We're going to expand that again to uh, help to allow the Vietnamese to acquire more weapons. We will still have, and it will be gradual, and there will still be restriction on the sale of weapons that could be used on, on things like crowd control or other human rights activities. Um, so, uh, and finally, um, we will work with ASEAN, uh, which is united in a way that they have never been before, to try to develop policies that indicate to the Chinese that it is not a productive enterprise for them to assume the nine dashed lines and control over international waterways in violation of all um, uh, norms of international behavior and law. So we will be working with the administration in developing ways to indicate to the Chinese that it is not to their benefit to uh, expand their control over one of the most important international waterways in, in the world. Yes. My name is Lilia Muslimova. I'm Humphrey Fellow from Ukrainian Peninsula of the Crimea. Uh, I'm so pleased. Uh, it's an honor for me to stay here, and uh, as you mentioned, maybe as you remember, you have m several meetings with Mustafa Jamilev, the leader of Crimean Tatar people. My question is about Crimea, of course, and as you mentioned, Putin's surname. After the war between Ukraine and Crimea in Eastern, Europe, in Eastern Ukraine has started, a lot of people, and especially international community and uh, journalists, they forgot about Crimea. Uh, do you have any advice or suggestion how to revitalize attention and how to return Crimea to Ukraine? And who can stop Putin? We are writing one of the most shameful chapters in American history. It has been an American tradition to help people who are struggling to repel invaders, to repel people who are dismembering their countries, and are slaughtering their citizens. Vladimir Putin is doing all of that and more. For the first time in 70 years, the liberal world order that was established after World War II is now being broken with the dismemberment of Ukraine by Vladimir Putin. And our failure to provide defensive weapons to Ukraine is shameful, and I'm frankly deeply embarrassed. Now, the latest, no I have predicted every single thing that Vladimir Putin <coughs> has done. 
from the taking of Crimea, which was obvious after Yanukovych was driven out because he felt he had to have Sevastopol to what's taking place in eastern Ukraine. The latest information we have is that there's the classic buildup that he is orchestrating right now. And I'm not sure whether it's Luhansk or Mariupol that is the next target, but there's no doubt he is preparing for further aggression in eastern Ukraine. No one even talks about Crimea, a, a nation, a, a part of Ukraine that was guaranteed in the Budapest Agreement when Ukraine gave up their nuclear inventory and specific in that agreement was a guarantee that Crimea would be part of Ukraine. Nobody talks about that anymore. No one talks about the shoot down of a Malaysian airliner, which was obviously done with Russian equipment at least, if not by Russian individuals. And there's routine violation of the Minsk agreements. And so we are treated to a visit by our Secretary of State to Sochi uh, with Vladimir Putin in the finest traditions of Neville Chamberlain. So um, there's no doubt that uh, Vladimir Putin has paid very little price for his aggression. The uh, Ukrainian economy is in very sad shape for a whole variety of reasons, particularly Eastern Ukraine being the industrial heartland. And frankly, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to see these brave young Ukrainians sacrifice their lives in a very unequal conflict when we refuse to give them weapons with which to defend themselves. So um, in this bill, we again authorize uh, the provision of, of defensive weapons to Ukraine. Um, but I have to be very frank. I see no indication that the President of the United States would agree to such a move, again, to our everlasting shame. Senator Wayne Balls, how do we counter the actions of uh, North Korea? I think it's very difficult. I think the key to a large degree to North Korean behavior is China. As I'm sure you are aware that if the Chinese cut off the economy of North Korea, it would be a matter of weeks before it collapsed. It seems to me it's in China's interest not to see this escalation on the part of the rotund ruler of North Korea. and. Um, and, and this is getting more and more dangerous from the latest information about they may have an undersea capability. Um, uh, uh, reaffirming our strong commitment to the Republic of Korea, the continued close relationship that we have, but it does become more and more dangerous as we see the North Koreans uh, increase uh, and make progress in their capabilities to deliver weapons of mass destruction. As we have our attention uh, diverted to, understandably, to the Middle East, some of the recent moves by North Korea are indeed disturbing. Um, defensive uh, uh, anti-missile capability is certainly part of that scenario that we have to continue to make sure we have. There are some who believe that the North Koreans are acquiring the capability to hit the United States of America. That is an um, argument for anti-missile capability. It's a tough situation. Senator McCain, I'm Rachel Hoff with the American Action Forum. Thank you so much for being here. I wonder if you could comment on um, the recent progress of the Islamic State in Iraq, um, particularly with regard to two things. Number one, our, our own Defense Secretary's comments about the Iraqi lack of will to fight, and, and then number two, um, what specifically the American role at this point should be. It's another stunning and breathtaking scenario. 
in the battle for Ramadi in 2007, we lost a significant number of young Marines and soldiers killed and wounded, just as we did in the second battle of Fallujah. And some of the weapons that killed Americans were the copper-tipped IEDs that were sent in by the Iranians into Iraq, which were the lethality of which would go right through armor and was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of soldiers and Marines. At the fall of Ramadi, the American Secretary of State said, well, it was a target of opportunity. Mr. Ernest, the present spokesman, said, well, we're not going to set our hair on fire every time there's a setback. And additional comments of that nature were made. Meanwhile, they go from, ISIS goes from house to house with a list executing people, burning their bodies in the streets, and of course tens of thousands had to flee. And this administration's spokesman says, we're not going to set our hair on fire every time there's a setback. In case you missed the news today, ISIS is now uh, making significant gains in Syria. They are approaching Aleppo. They have cut off the last transit point between Syria and Turkey, and they continue to make significant gains. The Free Syrian Army, in its desperation because of our failure to help them, have now joined forces with al-Nusra, which is an Islamist uh, group. And Mr. Soleimani, Qasim Soleimani, the head of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, is taking selfies outside of Tikrit in the battle there. And Shiite militias, the same militias that we fought against in the Battle of Sadr City, are now leading in attacks in Sunni populated territory. There is evidence after Tikrit was taken that atrocities were committed by the Shiite militias. Unless there is some kind of reconciliation and coalition between Sunni and Shia, we are going to be, uh, have an enormously difficult challenge. And we need more American boots on the ground. I'm happy to say that there is recent polling data because of the beheadings and other activities that a uh, majority of Americans now support. Not a massive influx of American troops, but American boots on the ground. 75% of the combat missions flown today over Iraq and Syria return fully loaded because there's nobody there to identify the targets on the ground. We all know that forward air controllers are the key to destroying targets, particularly moving targets. So, uh, and frankly, it's reminiscent of uh, a long time ago and far away during the Vietnam War, where we conducted similar kind of air com activities under Robert Strange McNamara. So, um, we're going, and, and there is no strategy. Uh, if anyone in the administration can ex explain a strategy, I'd like to hear it. There is none. And they want to defeat ISIS in Iraq, but what about Syria? What, what, what happens in Syria? An interesting thing is happening in Syria right now, and that is Bashar Assad, because of this long period of attrition, is becoming very weak, and he is... Uh, losing significant areas of his control. And most of that, those gains are made by ISIS, although some in, this are, in the south are uh, carried out by al-Nusra and the Free Syrian Army. But then what's going to happen? I predict to you that the Iranians are not going to give up on Bashar Assad. And I think you will see an increase in Iranian presence. Already, there are Iranians who are holding down cabinet positions 
in Bashar Assad's government. So I think you're going to see an escalation on the part of both the uh, Iranians and the, uh, uh, and the Russians. It will increase their supplies of weapons as well. They're not going to walk away from, the Iranians and the, and the Russians are not going to walk away from Syria. They're going to do everything they can to prop up Bashar Assad. So I'm sorry for the long answer. But this is a period where the United States is being tested. And many of the Gulf Sunni countries have made the decision that they can no longer rely on the United States of America, and they are going their own way, to wit, the Saudi campaign in Yemen today is the best example. Had some of the foreign men, uh, the ambassadors of the Gulf countries before our Armed Services Committee, just as an informal meeting, one of the ambassadors said, "We believe we are beginning to believe it's better to be America's enemy than its friend." I'm sure that that was an exaggeration, but I, there's no doubt there's every indication that the Gulf countries and the Saudis are going their own way because of their lack of reliability, because of America's lack of reliability. Reliability. Senator, uh, this is Ali Reza Jafar Zadeh with the National Council of Resistance of Iran, the Iranian Opposition. Uh, thank you very much for your great remarks regarding the uh, situation in Iraq and the role of the Iranian regime. I wanted to also uh, make a reference to North Korea and their relationship with Iran. Um, there were reports recently, uh, we found out that the North Koreans have been helping the Iranian regime extensively, not just in the missile area, but uh, building nuclear warheads and helping the nuclear program. <clears throat> they had a delegation in Iran in the last week of April, another delegation heading to Iran uh, later this month. How do you see this relationship developing as the uh, nuclear talks are going on uh, with uh, apparently no reference to this? And uh, how do you see the prospects of the nuclear talks um, and, and where it's heading, uh, especially in light of the Iran regime's nefarious involvement in Syria, in uh, Iraq, and everywhere else? Thank you, Senator. There's clearly a disconnect between the nuclear talks and Iranian activities in the region. They are now dominant force in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Lebanon, four countries. And now um, we are seeing a uh, significant increase in their influence in all four of those countries. This administration is laboring under the illusion that a nuclear agreement will then change the entire relationship between the United States and Iran, and we will be partners in bringing about a peaceful Middle East. That obviously has a certain credibility problem with the Arab nations, uh, the Sunni Arab nations in the region. And um, I, I've said for months and months, this administration is so desperate for an agreement that they will agree to almost anything. I'll be very interested in seeing how they handle the issue of, of unannounced inspections of their military bases. The Ayatollah has ruled that out. I will be interested in what the provisions will be for lifting the sanctions whether it's immediate or gradual, I will be very interested in knowing whether the, quote, snapback provisions, which uh, uh, in case of violation by the Iranians, that the sanctions would be reinstituted, uh, that I understand that these allegations of violations would be presented to a committee of which uh, Russians uh, and Iranians are part of the of the judgment being made. You know, you, you, some of this stuff you can't make it up. So, I am I am deeply worried that they will make an agreement which is very badly flawed. Finally, finally, the best overall assessment 
I believe, was in the Wall Street Journal a month or so ago, authored by Henry Kissinger and George Shultz. And they pointed out at the beginning that these talks have gone from the initial goal of eliminating Iranian nuclear capabilities to delaying Iranian nuclear capabilities. And I have, when I've been asked by my constituents about it and my description of it, I've sent them that op-ed by probably two of the most respected statesmen of our time and presented their point of view, which I think is probably a little bit more credible than mine. We have time for one more question. Uh, hi, Senator. Kevin Kosar of the R Street Institute, a think tank a few blocks from here. You mentioned the 53 consecutive years that the NDAA has uh, been passed and been passed in a timely fashion. That's a really remarkable uh, governance achievement. And I wonder, what accounts for that? That's not the way the rest of Congress tends to work. Are there factors about how the committee conducts its business or, or what? I think two impulses, one good, one not so good. <laughs> One impulse, of course, is the defense of the country and the many aspects of the authorizing legislation that are really vital, ranging from pay and benefits of the men and women who are serving to major challenges uh, that, that ranging from our defensive capabilities to acquisition, all the things that I described. The other not so uh, laudable impulse is that there's a lot in there for members of the committees. Um, a, a member, a, a United States senator or congressman who has significant defense involvement in their state or district naturally gravitate towards the committee. That's understandable and there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes there are many authorizations that have a direct impact on the economy and jobs uh, in their particular district or state. Uh, I have found, and all over the years that I worked with Carl Levin, and now working with Jack Reed also, there's a degree of bipartisanship that is a, a, a legacy that's been handing down, handed down to us. And None of us want to be the first to break that bipartisan uh, method of, of, of legislating and putting together a defense bill. In the last markup before the bill, it may be on the floor tonight or may not, because there is uh, a view by some of the Democrats, I don't know if there's enough, that because of OCO, they don't want to move forward with a defense authorization bill. I don't understand that logic because it seems to me it's a money issue and we're authorizers, but so we'll see this afternoon whether we get 60 votes to, uh, to proceed. But setting that OCO problem aside, we always work in a, in a almost unanimous fashion. There's a few outliers, but overall it's been uh, unanimous and therefore has been able to get through the Senate. Now in all candor, the last couple of years, Senator Reid decided to bring it up at the last minute and we didn't, did not get the full debate and amending that it deserved. I guarantee you if we take it up tonight, at the end of this week and next week, we will have over 200 amendments that will be considered by the committee either in conference, you know, amongst us will amendments we can accept without votes, and there will be many amendments that will be voted on as well. And frankly, that's what people expect us to do. And unfortunately, we haven't done a lot of that in the last few years. Can I thank you again, Doug, Fred? I thank all of you for being here, and I thank the American Action Forum, and I particularly their emphasis on youth and motivating and helping young men and women who are very interested in these issues to have a chance to be exposed and involved uh, in them and they will be looking forward to your retirement as soon as possible thank you very much. thank you very much and on thank that you. please join me in thanking the senator